unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I was glad when they said to me, we will go into the house of the Lord. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation, and so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him. Let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. 
We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please stand. O Lord, open thou our lips. And our mouth shall show forth thy grace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia.
A reading from the book of Amos. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is not darkness, it is not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear or went into a house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of the Lord.
a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all of those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The word of the Lord. O God, be in my mouth as I speak for you. Fill this place with your great grace, that we may leave this place less of what we used to be, more of what we ought to be, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When it comes to our family vacations, I generally have let my daughters choose the television programming. This has resulted in occasionally being held hostage by afternoon marathon showings of TV shows such as Catfish or America Ninja Warrior. There is one show, though, that always seems to be on the Learning Channel. It is called Say Yes to the Dress. <laughs> Have you ever had to endure, I mean watch, an episode of Say Yes to the Dress? 
It takes place at a very fancy bridal salon in New York City. Usually a bride arrives with an entourage of family members and friends, and they spend the next 30 minutes trying to find that one perfect wedding dress. Of course, you also get the backstory on the fiancé. He's always the most wonderful guy she ever met. He's kind, he's smart, he's funny, he's handsome. With three daughters, I can't wait to meet him someday. <laughs> anyway, my daughters give me various instructions about how I'm not going to be allowed to go shopping. It'll be Cynthia, their sisters, a maid of honor, or best friend. I won't be able to say yes to the dress until the day of the wedding. Although I guess at some point I'll be saying yes to the bill. <laughs> Just between us, after several years of watching the show, I've actually gotten pretty good at figuring out which dress she's going to choose. <laughs> I don't say this to you with any sense of pride, but at some point, as a dad, you just have to throw in the towel, admit that after several hours of watching, you're worn down, and you actually begin to care which dress is going to get the yes. Now, my vacation viewing habits on the Learning Channel might seem like a curious place to start a sermon. But a parable about bridesmaids and weddings got me thinking about the marriage custom in Jesus' time. And just as various customs, for better or for worse, such as picking out a dress, are part of our present cultural landscape, we should want to know more about how Jewish weddings took place in our Lord's day. Knowing these customs not only give us a historic context for our story, they can give us some further spiritual insight into the parable, especially when the parable shows a side of God's kingdom that makes us uncomfortable or seems to be at odds with Jesus' usual words about God's love God's compassion, and God's forgiveness. It is jarring for us to hear that the door has been shut and the Lord says, truly I tell you, I do not know you. So what do we know about the, Jesus, the Jewish customs in Jesus' day? Generally, there were four steps that made up the process of getting married. And fortunately, none of them involved a trip to the bridal shop. The first step was called the betrothal. This involved the prospective groom traveling from his father's house to the home of the prospective bride. He paid the purchase price and thus established the marriage covenant. You might recall that Mary was betrothed to Joseph in Matthew's Gospel when they found out that she was pregnant with Jesus. Joseph had planned to divorce Mary quietly, which you could do at this point in the process. But then you may remember an angel comes to him in a dream, and well, I guess you have to wait till Christmas to find out the rest of the story. Also, a brief word to you on bride price. While it's easy for us to sit here today and say the groom was buying his bride, in Jesus' day, the bride price acknowledged that the woman was an important and a vital contributor to the family. For her to be taken away from the family was for the family to lose someone whose contribution was invaluable. The price in Jesus' day recognized the woman's contribution. To not pay it was to say that she was worthless, and this would have been considered an insult both to the bride and her father. The second step of the marriage process is an interesting one. After the betrothal, the groom would go back to his father's house to prepare a room for his bride, or he might build an accommodation in another house next to his father's house. 
The groom would either build it himself, or if he came from a wealthy family, he would supervise the construction. This also meant that the bride and groom might be apart for a period of time up to 12 months, and the bride would never know how the construction was proceeding on her new home, or when the wedding feast might happen. And this gets us back to the circumstances of our parable this morning. In the third step of the marriage ritual, the groom comes for his bride, and this coming was a secret, and it was meant to be a surprise to the bridal family. They did not know when the groom would show up with his entourage to claim his bride and fulfill his terms of the marriage covenant. Hence, you have the bridesmaids waiting outside the father's house. Once they got the word, the groom had gone to retrieve his new wife. The fourth and final step of the marriage is the party. It's the celebration itself. The groom would return with his bride and entourage to his father's house and their new accommodations. They would consummate the marriage, and they would celebrate a wedding feast that would last seven days. A seven-day feast helps explain why they may have run out of wine at that wedding in Cana of Galilee where Jesus performed his first miracle. But as evidence from these traditions, wedding celebrations were a lot more complicated than simply going to New York to find a dress. This four-step process, though, I think helps flesh out the parable a bit and gives us a fuller understanding of the backdrop of Jesus' story. Jesus always knew his audience, and he knew they would hear the story in their own cultural context. Our present church tends to hear the parable simply as God being judgmental and harsh. But I believe we should be careful, or we should be a bit more nuanced in our criticism of Jesus' words. So what steps do we need to take this morning together so that we can say yes to the parable? First, while we tend to focus on the five foolish bridesmaids, we should not forget an important character who's working off stage, and that's the groom. It is the groom who has done all the actual work in the story. He is the one who has asked for the bride's hand. He has paid the bride price, and he has spent the past year building an addition to his home and getting ready for the marriage feast. He has made a covenant that includes the bride, her family, his own family, and their friends. If we see the groom as Jesus, it is clear that our Lord has taken steps so that everyone, everyone will be included as part of the celebration. Every single person living around the groom's home or the bride's home knows that a wedding is coming. They know where the celebration is going to be. They even know what they have to do themselves to be ready for that party. While the actual day and time might be a bit of a surprise, I suspect that with a little bit of gossip in a small town, they were actually very few secrets, very few secrets that could be kept about the timing of the feast. In other words, I think the bridesmaid arrived knowing, they arrived knowing when the groom is going to be there. He may be a few hours late, but the wise bridesmaids would have known it took time to go from point A to B in the dark, and they would have been ready for this. So why were the other bridesmaids foolish about their supply of oil? Well, this question's a bit harder to answer. The Greek word for foolish can mean dull or sluggish, but it may also imply that the individual person is more of a scoundrel and has no moral standards. We tend to think of foolish in our present day as someone who's just simply harmless, a fool. But Jesus' use of the word in the parable might mean that the five foolish bridesmaids have chosen the easy path. They do not know the Lord because they have made choices in their lives that have separated them from God's love and God's compassion. God does not know them because they have chosen not to know God. In other words, you might say they have chosen to say yes to themselves and not yes to the Lord. 
The second point that should not be lost on our modern ears is that our parable occurs in a section of Matthew's Gospel after Jesus has said some very harsh words about his opponents. He has called the Pharisees and the Sadducees blind guides, hypocrites, who cling the outside of the cup, but inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. These are the leaders, my friends, that sit on Moses' seat of power. They've been entrusted with the sacred law and are by tradition spiritual guides that should be helping the common folk find their way to a closer relationship to God and eventually an invitation to that great marriage feast. They have chosen to betray this trust. And one way to understand our parable is to hear our Lord saying to those people, those who have kept others from enjoying the celebration, those who have been in the way of others, he says one day they will indeed pay a price for their spiritual snobbery, their arrogance, their foolishness. So finally, what's our takeaway from this morning's lesson about the wise and the foolish bridesmaids? Once again, I think it's important to emphasize that a life in Christ is about celebration. Time and time again in the Gospels, our Lord returns to stories about great feasts, great parties. Jesus wants our life with God to be a life of service to others, but it is to be a joyful celebration of the blessings God has given to us. But in order for us to say yes to God, we have to say no to the values of this world. We have to say no to our greed, our selfishness, our hypocrisy, and our hate. There is, in fact, plenty of oil for those lamps, but we have a choice of whether we decide to take it. We have a choice about whether we are going to be prepared for the bridegroom's arrival. And God is not going to take away our free will. And God is not going to make that choice for us. In fact, as the Christian church, we have an even greater responsibility. We know when and where the feast is going to be held each week. It is found around this table, this altar. It is found through the body and blood of our Lord. It is a feast meant for all God's people, the wise and the foolish. But the foolish have to choose to be here. And we have to make sure that as part of the religious establishment, we don't keep others from sharing in that wonderful celebration. In another part of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says these words, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. This is our invitation to the marriage feast. This is how we should understand what it means when we invite others to join us and to share in this great celebration. The bridegroom is here, the celebration is ready to begin, and the oil is plentiful. But are you ready to say yes? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Standing, let us reaffirm our faith in the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Kneeling as you are able, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And Endue thy ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under thy care. Let thy way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. O God, whose blessed Son was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life. Grant us, we beseech thee, that having this hope, we may purify ourselves even as he is pure, that when he shall appear again with power and great glory, we may be made like unto him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where with thee, O Father, and thee, O Holy Ghost, he liveth and reigneth, one God, world without end. Amen. O God, who makest us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of thy Son, our Lord, grant us this day such blessing through our worship of thee, that the days to come may be spent in thy favor, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray thee so to guide and govern us by thy Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget thee, but may remember that we are ever walking in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who didst stretch out thine arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of thy saving embrace, so clothe us in thy spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know thee to the knowledge and love of thee. For the honor of thy name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in lifting up to God those who have asked for our prayers. Elizabeth Austin, Paxton Campbell, Bonnie Coghill, Andrew Dixon, Len Felton, Ed Hartman, Future Wills, Joe Hartlong, Eleanor Lynch, Eve McRae, Annette Phillips, Courtney Reynolds, Mark Shuford, Melissa Silver, Connie Spillman, Doug Sullivan, Marsha Rose Sullivan, Stephanie Sullivan, and Isis Williams, and Lyndon Eves, Henry Maudlin, and Armistead Williams. Almighty God, we commend to thy gracious care and keeping 
all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with thy heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils which beset them and grant them a sense of thine abiding presence wherever they may be. We ask for thy traveling mercies on the Haiti mission team, which returns today. We pray for the homeless, the disenfranchised, and all victims of violence, especially those recently killed in Sutherland Springs, Texas. We give thanks for the birth of Blythe May Masia, daughter of Molly and TJ Masia, who was born November 3rd. We give thanks for the lives and ministries of all who celebrate their birthdays this week, especially Marty Parrish, Elsie Bemis, Missy Williams, and Hayes Gersack, who celebrate their birthday today. We also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Alice Burrell Reed and Linda Smith Baber, who died recently, and Emma Conquest Wheat, James Clifton Wheat, Mr. and Mrs. Edwin Parker Conquest, James Clifton Wheat Jr., and Wiley Hardy, Wiley Hardy Wheat, in whose memory the flowers at the altar are given. Grant, O oh God, that thy holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace. Gracious God, forgive us for forgetting that you made us in your image and sent us here to do your work of reconciliation. Forgive us for forgetting that you are in charge and know what needs to be done to heal this broken world. Walk with us and teach us so that in listening to you, we can stand strong as followers of Christ. We pledge to you our hearts, our talents, and our treasure. Emboldened by your love, we can say, here I am, use me. Please join me in saying together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Won't you please be seated.
Gracious God, source of all creation, all love, and all true joy, accept, we pray, these outward signs of our profound and continuing thankfulness for all life. Keep each of us ever thankful for all the blessings of joy and challenge that come our way. Bless those who will benefit from these gifts through the outreach of the United Thank Offering. This we ask through him, who is the greatest gift and blessing of all, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to St. James's. It's a pleasure to welcome you, especially if you're a newcomer to our parish. Uh, just an encouragement to please fill out a pew card and introduce yourself to the clergy following our service, and we can also help you find a welcome packet back in the narthex. Uh, the Chimes is full of lots of information this week and opportunities to be of service to others, so I encourage you to take it home and look at it carefully. Just a couple of quick highlights. First of all, uh, I know it's a little awkward when we have the UTO offering, but uh, I appreciate everyone who participated in it. It's one of the oldest ministries in the Episcopal Church, and your support of the United Thank Offering goes and supports many ministries throughout the National Church. Uh, so thank you very much for your contribution today. The Taste of St. James is this Wednesday night, November 15th. Uh, there's a wonderful reception from 5 to 7 p.m. in Valentine Hall. Please come by to purchase soups, hors d'oeuvres, gourmet baked goods, and you may also pick up your pre-ordered casseroles. All proceeds this year benefit Food Force, St. James's program to feed the homeless. So I encourage you to come out to celebrate and also to support a good cause. Food lists for the Central Virginia Food Bank Thanksgiving collection are in our narthex in the back of the church this morning. Uh, bring food in grocery bags, please, with handles to the narthex anytime during the next several weeks or right up to Thanksgiving Day when we'll have our service at 10 o'clock in the morning. So please do support this effort. Uh, two quick music announcements. There will be a choral Eucharist at our 1115 service next Sunday, November 19th, and our youth choir Evensong will also be next Sunday at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. One of the things I've enjoyed doing uh, through the years as rector of churches is to take a, to pause for a moment and to honor and recognize uh, the veterans in our congregations. So if you are a veteran, if you could please just stand for a moment so we can uh, do a little honoring of you. Thank you for saying yes to our country. Walk in love as Christ loved us, gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
If any of you this morning are, have a birthday or an anniversary you'd like to have blessed, I invite you to come forward to the altar rail or if you have any other prayers for laying on of hands and prayers. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good gift and every perfect gift, send down upon our bishops, our clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and has promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The peace of God which surpasseth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.